Hello fellow AGD coders and welcome to another video and uh, this is one I know some of you have been looking forward to we're going to be looking at how to build an attribute buffer so of course the question then is uh, what would we need an attribute buffer for and uh, how can we build it and obviously then how do we use it so uh, let's take a look at a game uh, Andy Johns uh, sent me this uh, demo of, uh, of a game that he's working on which is a sequel to Nixie and um, we can see here the uh, the problem that uh, AGD has when you try to use uh, colored sprites so uh, let's take a look here and as you can see if you look at this blue knight here moving across look what happens when he hits the uh, castle there as you can see just over here he's basically just going along and painting everything as he's moving and um, as some of you know you can put a uh, sprite ink at the start and the end of the code and then it will basically paint it back to white but what it won't do is uh, paint it back to the original block color so that's really the problem if we have a look here for example this is gray rather than white and uh, down here as well and uh, if we were to look at uh, uh, another screen then we could see uh, another another similar situation here because obviously different parts of the screen are different colors so here we've got some grass which is green and uh, this column here it's got some white and uh, I've also added a little bit of gray just to show the effect so obviously unless you can kind of detect and know where the sprite is and change the color accordingly you're gonna have these problems as you can see here look the main character is being turned blue there and the guy is just uh, leaving just a whole wash of of paint if you like all over the screen so um, we'd have to we'd have to adjust the uh, the spriting parameters every time depending on which part of the screen the the knight was moving over so it really wouldn't be very practical so ultimately the solution then is to create an attribute buffer and um, what that will do is uh, when the screen loads it will take a copy of all the colors on the screen and um, and it will then uh, restore them as the night moves along so as you can see here I've got it running and as you can see when he hits the uh, when when he hits uh, something with a different color temporarily of course he changes it to that color that's uh, just part of the spectrum's uh, makeup really you can't really change that but as you can see uh, it doesn't it doesn't paint the whole place and uh, basically as the sprite is moving it's uh, it's of course got its own color but it's not affecting the rest of the screen because we've created a buffer so in order to understand how this works uh, we'll go to this memory map which I showed you in my last video uh, please go back and watch that it's definitely useful and uh, what I'm gonna do then is uh, I'm gonna use up a little bit of the top memory here and uh, I'm gonna create an attribute buffer now I'm not actually gonna make it 768 because in this game you'll notice that um, the bottom four rows are not within the game screen so uh, there'll be no knights wandering around to painting the town blue down there so uh, all we really need is 640 bytes rather than 768 so that would cover the uh, top part of the screen apart from the last four rows which we don't need to change and uh, conveniently enough that gives us 128 bytes um, if we start at 64,000 and uh, that gives us just enough space to put the code in to handle the buffer um, you could put this code in in the character set as I've done before but uh, it's quite handy that this uh, just quite snugly fits in there out of the way and it means that you don't have to uh, to worry about uh, using the character set for other things obviously if you use a buffer which is a full screen 768 then you would have to put the code somewhere else so basically yeah we'll create the space there and uh, we'll then be able to load it in and as you can see here we've got this area there which is not being used so I'll be able to uh, to store that as you can see one two three four so I'll be able to store the code um, 
in uh, in higher memory and uh, we won't we won't need to restore this part of the screen because nothing is happening in game on that part of the screen and as i said it's just enough space to fit the code in which is quite handy obviously um with agd if you save the code off in higher memory it won't be kept so you'll have to find a way of loading it back in um, agdx is going to hopefully give the option to do that at any rate let's take a look at the actual uh, attribute buffer code now um, it's fairly straightforward and even if you don't have a great understanding of assembly it should be fairly clear to you how this works so the first thing we do is we set up the point the start point of the code which is at 64640 which is obviously 64000 plus the 640 buffer space and as you can see here all we're doing is we're setting up uh, the three registers to make a, a memory copy and so we're going to copy from HL which is at 22528 and we're going to copy it over to 64000 which is where our buffer is and we're going to copy 640 bytes so we do that and we then run the LDIR command and that will basically loop through and copy the whole thing really quite quickly and uh, as you can see here this is this is the opposite so the first one is uh, is obviously reading the screen and writing it to the buffer and this one we can uh, read the buffer and uh, write to the screen so obviously this would restore all our colors uh, if we want to now um, obviously we don't really want to do that uh, across the whole game there's no need to restore the whole screen because obviously a sprite is just going to be um, affecting a small part of the screen so we'll look at some more code a little bit later in the video uh, to um, to show you how to restore a small part of the screen but first of all let's look at how we trigger AGD and allow it to uh, grab a copy of uh, the attributes so we need to do this after the screen has uh, loaded so we're gonna have to do this every time we load a new screen now the problem here is that uh, if I basically put a key command in here a wait key you'll see what happens and um, it's this restart screen the screen hasn't been drawn yet so we can't run it here because if we do um, we will we'll just get zeros because there is literally no color there at that point so we can't run it at the restart screen point so what we actually have to do is um, run it in the code which comes immediately after the restart screen and uh, the code which comes after the restart screen uh, we, that we can actually access is uh, main loop one so we're gonna have to put the code into main loop one but we have another problem which we can look at here if I put a wait command in here in main loop one to show where the uh, where the code stops obviously the clue is in the name it's a loop and it's going to be repeating and repeating and if we put something in here as you can see we're just going to get completely stuck because we'll we'll just continually uh, grab the colors of the screen um, every cycle and we definitely don't want to do that so we have to come up with a system that allows us to run a one-off call in the main loop when a screen is reloaded so the trick that we use here is to use the variable rand and what I've done here is I've set the variable rand to 255 the reason for that is that um, in any situation when you use the get rand command the random number can never be uh, 255 it can only be naught to 254 so rand being 255 is a unique situation that can only be created by you by choosing to do so here in the script unless of course you are using rand to do something else like temporary variables so bear that in mind if you're using it to do that you could use a different variable one that you know is not going to be affected when the screen is loading so uh, when the screen restarts it will go straight to the main loop in this case I'm using rand if you know what you're doing you could try a different variable but rand is uh, probably the best choice really because as I said you can still use rand as a random number generator and it'll never generate 255 so it'll never be triggered so obviously then what we do is in the main loop 
we just check for rand being 255 and that's when we run our code there and there you can see the assembly code which basically runs the um, copy of the attributes over to the uh, buffer and uh, then of course finally what we do is we set run to be zero so that uh, it won't be triggered a second time so it'll only be triggered when the screen initializes I'll put a wait key in here just to show you there that's the point at which the uh, screen is going to copy the attributes and what you'll notice here if you look at these sprites you'll notice that they have been drawn because AGD just does draw those sprites in um, before the main loop starts but um, there's no color the sprites haven't been colored yet because obviously the spriting commands are in the player script and they haven't been triggered yet so we're catching the, the screen just at the right point there just when uh, the uh, the colors that we want to grab are all in place and uh, so obviously that's ideal and it will only do it once as you can see I've got it paused here because we put a wait key command we then press the wait key and obviously it continues so it's a good way of just showing you exactly the point in the code where we are at it's a sort of debugging trick if you like so essentially uh, yeah that's the first part the first thing to do then what we have now done using that code is taken a copy of uh, all the colors in the top uh, 20 rows of the screen and uh, that means that uh, when we use something like sprite ink or we change the color somewhere we can change it back to whatever it was when the screen first loaded and uh, that's the basic principle of the attribute buffer so we'll now move on to look at how we can restore color from the attribute buffer to a sprite as it uh, as it moves along dynamically without having to restore the entire screen so uh, we'll look at that next so let's think about what our objectives are here the first thing that we want to do of course is determine the current sprite coordinates that's pretty easy to do the next thing is to calculate which blocks in memory the sprite is currently over that is to say which blocks on screen in terms of attributes and then finally we want to restore those particular blocks with uh, information held in the buffer. So let's take a look at this little knight as we saw in the demonstration at the start and uh, this is in ZX Paintbrush and what you can see here is when a sprite is uh, set up it's normally covering exactly four blocks so that's going to be the minimum amount of blocks that we have to cover. However if a sprite is in a different position for example if the character has moved across say four pixels here then clearly you can see from this video that now the sprite is covering six blocks so it's basically straddling the cells so we need to take that into account and of course if we then move the sprite down it's even more so we're now covering a total of nine so we have to take that into account when we're thinking about how many blocks we have to restore from the sprite buffer so that's another consideration um, to, uh, to take into account and of course the other thing to think of is the fact that um, if we had a 16 by 24 sprite it would be even bigger than that so it would be actually 12 blocks so uh, that's another thing to consider okay so let's go now and uh, have a look at the script and uh, let's see how we actually determine those three steps that I've already mentioned. So we've got a script set up here and um, we've integrated the previous uh, code that I showed you uh, for copying the buffer over. So let's just review everything that we have so far and then we'll look at the main new routine which we're going to add. So obviously here we have uh, variables, object and option. These are AGD variable addresses. We're not actually going to need those for this part of the video. This is uh, for uh, adding some effects with the attribute buffer later, like the uh, lightning that you might have seen on the uh, Facebook page. Here we've got uh, two, two other variables, two other addresses, which hold the X and Y coordinates. They actually hold the line and column values uh, within AGD, and we'll be using those along with this routine, which is uh, called test block. Uh, TSBL which is short for test block uh, this is an inbuilt AGD routine and it's used to get the address 
uh, within the attribute buffer, the, the attribute memory, that is to say, of a particular uh, line and column. And this routine is used by things like uh, testing for deadly or custom blocks. Um, and it looks at the block buffer in the memory. Uh, so we're going to have to basically offset that block buffer and uh, that will allow us to look at the actual uh, attribute position. And that's why we use this B offset here, which is a buffer offset. And as you'll see in the code a bit later, we use that to determine um, the position of the attribute buffer. So here's a little reminder. Um, we've got um, here, obviously, the block buffer at the top. And then here, we've got the attribute buffer and the buffer code. And you'll notice that the buffer is 768 bytes uh, behind the uh, block buffer. And uh, that's three sets of 256. Uh, and that's important because when we're dealing with the registers in the memory, we only have to adjust the high bit, the high byte rather than the low byte because we can move in increments of 256. And so this buffer offset here, uh, we can actually add it to the um, attribute buffer location and it will give us the location on screen. Um, all three of the buffers, the uh, block buffer, the attribute buffer, and the screen are all uh, divisible by 256, so we can just use, use a, a high byte, and uh, that will allow us to move quickly from one part in the memory to another. And as you can see here, uh, just a review of what we looked at before. So we've got 64,000 here, which is the uh, start of the attribute buffer, and then we've got the screen buffer there as well. And as we know, 64768 is the address of the um, of the block buffer, which is used by AGD. And that's the routine that test block finds. It will give us a, a value in the block buffer. And we can then work from that value backwards to get the attribute buffer address. And uh, then we can use that to determine also the screen address by simply moving the high byte value. So uh, yeah, we've reviewed this already, as you can see. And this, this is the part which uh, copies the attribute uh, screen to the uh, attribute buffer and uh, back again. So let's move down now and take a look at the actual uh, code which is going to uh, replace the value on the screen that has been spriting with uh, a value in the attribute buffer. So we'll start here with uh, loading in the x and y coordinates of the sprite itself. So this is in the IX register, plus 8, plus 9. We then load B with uh, the value 2, because we're going to be using two rows initially. Following that, we are going to test to see if the sprite is straddling. This is why we load it into the accumulator here, and then use an AND7. Uh, this allows us to test if uh, the uh, X coordinate is divisible by 8, because it will basically slice off all the other, by all the other bits. And um, so if we're left with a 0, we'll know that the number is divisible by 8. And that's why we have a, a GR0 here, because if we have a number left over, it means that the sprite is straddling a cell. So we need to increase B by 1, because it means that we need 3 rows rather than 2, as I showed you with ZX Paintbrush earlier. So once we've done that, we can transfer the sprite coordinates that are held in HL over to disp X and disp Y, and that will allow us to run the test block routine, which finds the position in the block buffer. But of course, we're looking for the attribute buffer, so we step back H three times here, and that basically will show us the position in the attribute buffer, because we're minus 256 each time we uh, decrease H, because H is the high byte, which holds uh, increments of 256. So we now have the address in the attribute buffer. So that's the start. That's what we want to copy. We now need to load the screen address into DE. So to calculate that, uh, we know that the low byte is going to be the same because these are all divisible by 256. Uh, and then we add this uh, buffer offset here to the value held in the H register. And that will basically uh, move the, if you look at the top here, you can see we've got the screen is at 22528 and uh, the attribute buffer is at 64,000. So what we want to do here is if we add 5e, we're going to basically subtract because it's going to roll over over 65535 and back round 
to the screen attribute memory which is around the 22528 mark. Okay, so now we have the values. We're just going to run a little check here. You can see 5B and uh, 5B00 is the top of the attribute memory. So what I'm doing here is just making sure that we're not overlapping, we're not going over the screen memory. So if the sprite for some reason is going off screen right down the bottom, uh, it could cause a problem, it could uh, load data um, off over the top of attribute memory, above attribute memory, into the reserved area, and that would just uh, obviously cause a crash. So we'll just do a little check there to make sure that, um, that that's okay. It's just a fail safe. And then after that, because we're using an LDI, which is basically uh, copying from uh, HL to DE, uh, that reduces uh, the BC register automatically. So I'm loading uh, C here with the value 4, uh, and that basically means that when these LDIs are activated, the, uh, the C value here um, will be reduced, but B won't be affected, because of course we're using B as our counter for our rows. So we just, uh, again, another fail-safe just to make sure that the code works as it should. We then load display Y, and we're running another check, as we've seen already, to check for straddling cells. And um, if that is the case, we will do another LDI, and then we'll step HL back one step to take that into account as well. Finally, here at the bottom, we load DE with 30 because obviously we've moved two spaces and we want to go down one row, which the total would be 32. So we add 30 to DE and then we jump back to the start of the code if the B counter uh, is, is still uh, valid. So once, twice or three times if it's straddling a cell. So here you can see what will happen is it will go back, it will then load E back with the L value, it will calculate the offset and it will recalculate the, the value for DE uh, to know where on screen to copy and we'll keep repeating that. So that saves us uh, using the stack basically. We can just uh, use an offset like that and um, that will do the job for us. Okay, so that's pretty much how, uh, how the uh, script works. If we go back again now you can see it in action and it's basically here what it's doing is uh, right at the start we loaded in all the colors and here, as the sprite is moving along, uh, rather than painting with sprite uh, 7, which we would normally do, it's instead running the routine and uh, checking the sprite area and restoring it from the sprite buffer to the correct colors that were there when the screen first loaded. So that's why here in the code at the top, rather than uh, sprint 7, which we would normally write here, we have this uh, assembly code. And if we scroll down, here, if we just uh, move down to the bottom of the code here, you'll see uh, that we have at the bottom here, Sprink 69, which is the color of the sprite. It's a bright blue. So as with regular AGD code, uh, we put the spriting at the end of the code. And the reason for that is that if the sprite has moved, um, obviously we want to update it with our color um, for the next cycle. So that's the reason the spriting goes at the bottom, for those of you who are wondering. And uh, we put the correction up at the top because obviously we're covering over where the sprite previously was. And that's the reason that we put that at the top and that at the bottom. Might seem strange, but it's also logical if you think about it. Okay, so let's review the whole thing. In the game, in the restart screen, uh, we have the set rand, let rand 255. That's going to trigger our attribute load. In the main loop, we have a small routine that checks for the value of rand here and uh, executes a copy of the attribute buffer, which is here. And finally, for any sprite that you want to use uh, to correct its coloring, then you need to put this assembly at the top. And then you put the sprite ink color at the bottom as per usual. So all in all, it uh, really doesn't take up a lot of space uh, apart from the fact, obviously, that you have to use the attribute buffer uh, at 64,000, which means that we are using up 768 bytes, which could otherwise be used for sprites or objects and so on. So when you're looking at your memory, the amount of memory you have left, uh, you have to subtract 768 from it. If your memory goes below 768, 
up here in this report, it will mean that you're overwriting the attribute buffer. But I do think this is quite a nice effect, and it does open the door to quite a lot more uh, flexibility in terms of the use of color. I've already shown on the Facebook page a couple of examples of that with things like lightning and uh, fading in, and uh, there's there's quite a lot of other ideas I've had about ways that we can make use of uh, of this buffer. So it probably is quite a good trade-off for the results that you get. Okay, so uh, that will be in future videos, and uh, I hope you found this one useful. Please like and subscribe if you have, and of course if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. But in the meantime, take good care, and as always, happy coding. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.